Good morning, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for coming together. Uh, I know it's a little bit tight, but um, we've got some important and exciting uh, news this morning. Two months ago, I'm Daryl Steinberg, by the way, uh, president of the, the California Senate. Well, you never know. Some people might not know. Two months ago, I told the Sacramento Press Club that I wanted to stoke a debate about strengthening California's already strong environmental policy. The feedback I received was healthy. Reasonable people differed. It was civic discourse at its best. I'm here today to present the product of that debate, this time with many more allies and fewer opponents. And I want to acknowledge the broad coalition uh, that is standing with me here today, some of whom you will hear from in a moment, and then I want to describe the proposal. Robbie Hunter, the president of the State Building and Construction Trades Council of California. Jim Arp, California Alliance for Jobs and Nodoff, Natural Resources Defense Council. Tom Adams, environmental activist and retired environmental lawyer. Seamus Roller and Julie Snyder from Housing California. Marina Wyant from the California Housing Consortium. Joshua Shaw from the California Transit Association. Steve Heminger from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Bill Higgins, the California Association of Councils of Government. Chris McKenzie, the League of California Cities. Mike McKeever, uh, the director of the, of the Sacramento Area Council of Government, SACOG. Don Saylor, the vice chair of the board and Yolo County supervisor. Deanne Baker from CSAC. Will Kempton, the executive director of Trans California. Amanda Eakin from NRDC. David Zisser, public advocates. Josh Stark from Transform, and I'm sure uh, Joel Keller, Bay Area Rapid Transit, and Jeannie Ward-Waller, Safe Routes to School National Partnership. All in one breath, but you can see we have quite a breadth of support here. I remarked back at the press club in February that if all you report is that Steinberg proposes carbon tax, you're missing half the speech, and you're missing half the point. My larger concern then and now is the economic impact on low and moderate income people and preserving and strengthening our essential climate goals. The priority, as I said, remains. Today I am pivoting from a carbon tax to continue using the very successful cap and trade strategy going forward. When fuels come under the cap in 2015, cap and trade may soon begin generating up to $5 billion annually. I propose a long-term investment strategy to both aggressively reduce greenhouse gas emissions and meet more demand for clean infrastructure. I am a quick learner. Unlike the last time, I am thrilled to stand with a broad coalition, a coalition of good environmental stewards, advocates for social justice, experts in transit-oriented development, and the working men and women of California. The driving force behind this plan is threefold. Number one, investments that reduce greenhouse gas emissions get funding priority. Two, social equity, economic development, and climate change go together. And three, permanent sources of funding for mass transit and affordable housing are key if we are committed to long-term change. Mass transit and affordable housing face a catastrophic funding crisis in California. State funding for affordable housing was eliminated almost entirely during the global recession. The funding shortfall for mass transit between 2011 and 2020 is $22 billion in operating funds and $42 billion in capital funds. Californians are logging more vehicle miles annually than ever before. 360 billion miles in 2012, and were projected to break the 400 billion mile barrier by 2020. And the growing toxic cloud of emissions is terrible for the environment and disproportionately impacts disadvantaged low-income communities where there are higher rates of respiratory illness, hospitalization, and premature death from inordinately substandard air quality. This long-term investment strategy dedicates a permanent source of funding 
for transit and affordable housing in sustainable communities like BART's MacArthur Plaza. And this long-term investment strategy is a guaranteed catalyst for job creation as California continues to build its recovery. A standard assessment used by the federal and state government projects that for every $1 billion invested in transportation projects alone creates 17,000 jobs. The strategy provides a permanent source of funding for highway and road rehabilitation consistent with climate change, must improve the climate, to improve traffic flows and repair and retrofit streets for cycle lanes. The strategy provides a permanent source of funding for the governor's high-speed rail project, which is projected to reduce heavy emissions generated by air and road travel. The strategy identifies funding for green infrastructure projects and clean vehicle programs, seed funds to assist clean projects and rebates for consumers. The strategy ensures that California's suite of climate policies taken as a whole provides a net benefit to disadvantaged and low-income communities as California reduces greenhouse gas emissions, goals that were heavily endorsed by voters with their rejection of Proposition 23 in 2010. As this legislature and the governor seeks to build on two of its most ambitious and productive agendas in recent history, Implementing this long-term investment strategy of cap-and-trade funds would be a huge victory for the economy, for employment, and for the large majority of Californians who overwhelmingly stood for AB 32 at the ballot box in 2010. And just this last weekend, the press from national and international experts say that the climate problem grows worse, that we have no time to sit back and wait and think about an investment strategy year to year or just short term. Now's the time to grab the moment and create these permanent sources to improve the climate, to clean the air, to invest in jobs. I now want to give the podium over to uh, others who uh, represent much of this broad coalition. Uh, I'm really pleased uh, because again, from where I started, I'm the proud author of SB 375, and uh, that took years uh, to pass. But, you know, we stoked a debate a couple of months ago, and uh, a lot of consternation and controversy, and I understand it. But now, many of us stand together, um, and stand together to build and to move forward. Let me turn it over to Robbie Hunter, the President of the State Building and Construction Trades Council of California. Robbie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the state building and construction trades in California, uh, we have suffered uh, the, the worst unemployment over the last 10 years, far worse than the, the uh, Great Depression. Uh, and the fact that we were not working was our issue, but the infrastructure was not being built because there was no money. We were behind before the recession. We're way behind now. Uh, the use of cap and trade uh, for uh, affordable housing, uh, for transit-oriented projects, uh, for mass transit like the high-speed rail, and for water projects. Uh, both will drive the economy, uh, will address the environment, and will meet our infrastructure needs. And I'd like to thank the Pro Tem for his leadership on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robbie. Really appreciate you. Jim Arp, the Executive Director of the California Alliance for Jobs, has been working long and hard along with other members of the coalition to try and identify what could be a permanent source. Jim. Good morning. I want to thank Senator Pro Tem Daryl Steinberg for his leadership on this very important effort. There has been significant legislation in recent years, some of it authored by Senator Steinberg, that has demonstrated Californians' commitment to address climate change in a meaningful way. All of those efforts have brought us to where we are today. There is an essential but modest and worthwhile cost that will uh, accrue to all of us as we work to reduce our carbon footprint. St Senator Steinberg uh, has shown in his proposal how revenue that will be generated from this effort would be invested into programs and infrastructure that will further reduce greenhouse gas emissions in California. Speaking on behalf of the contractors and thousands of skilled union construction workers who build and maintain our transportation, our water, and other vital infra infrastructure that we uh, rely on every day, we support the concepts outlined in Senator Steinberg's proposal 
that would make significant investments in new transit facilities, road improvements, bike paths, and alternative transportation modes that will help all of us get out of our cars more often. The proposal will generate thousands of jobs while at the same time reducing greenhouse gas in California. We realize there is much work that lies ahead to refine and shape this proposal into legislation. We are committed to working with the legislature and with the governor, with Senator Steinberg and his fellow uh, legislators to get this job done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Before I introduce the next speaker, I want to reemphasize a point. Um, all the monies contained in this plan are going to be allocated on a competitive basis based upon uh, how they rank in terms of improving the climate. And all the dollars have to be consistent with my colleague, the next pro tem, Senator De Leon's SB 535, which requires that disadvantaged communities receive at least 25 percent of the funds. Let me introduce Tom Adams, well-known environmental activist and retired environmental lawyer. Uh, it was my privilege to work closely with Senator Steinberg when he uh, got SB 375 enacted, and I'm proud to stand here today supporting the, the proposals that he's making. The investments that Senator Steinberg is uh, proposing today will lead to healthier and cleaner communities, but they will also do so in a way that is fair to Californians, will improve social equity, and enable Californians at all economic levels to benefit. Over there in the circus tent of the climate deniers, the carnival barkers are saying that doing something about climate will cause hardship. Today, Senator Steinberg's proposals prove that wrong. Sound climate policy will lead to rebuilding our cities, improving our transportation, creating jobs, and increasing social equity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Excuse me just a second here. Let me uh, now turn it over to another uh, great environmental leader, Ann Nodoff, the California Director of the National Resources Defense Council. Annie. Thank you, Senator. Um, NRDC welcomes this positive change in direction. We support investing in California's communities and clean transportation. The job isn't quite done yet. There's more to do to decarbonize our transportation sector, and we look forward to working with the senator, the governor, and the legislature as we move forward to get the details uh, hammered out in this proposal. But it's uh, overall, it's a really good step, and it's great to see California uh, putting its money where its mouth is when it comes to climate uh, protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annie. Seamus Roller, the Executive Director of Housing California, another very important member of our coalition, fighting hard in tough times to make sure that working people have housing that's close to transit that contributes to the climate goals. I didn't mean to give away your speech. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a minute to rewrite what I was about to say. Uh, it's great to be up here with Senator Steinberg, who's really been a champion for working families and the most vulnerable in California. This proposal really reflects the role that working families have to play in reducing climate change in California. Those families that are working to make ends meet in California are the most likely ones to use public transportation, the ones most likely to give up their cars if given the opportunity to do so. Housing is really a critical tool in, in addressing climate change in California. How we design our neighborhoods, how we design our communities impacts how much energy we use and impacts how much we drive. Really, California is very unaffordable. So many of the places that, that people live in California, it takes just almost someone's entire paycheck just to be able to make ends meet. And Senator Steinberg's proposal is a huge leap forward to make sure that all the people in California can have a safe and affordable home. Thank you very much, Janice. <clears throat> Talked about the great gap in transit funding, and you think about all of the local communities that have tried to uh, pass transportation measures with the two-thirds vote threshold, how difficult that is. Look at Los Angeles uh, just a couple of years ago. Please welcome Josh Shaw, the Executive Director of the California Transit Association. Thank you, Senator Steinberg. The role of local transit systems is to move people safely, efficiently, and cleanly from place to place, provide mobility. And we know that cap-and-trade was implemented by the Air Resources Board to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. 
the sustainable communities plans that our metropolitan regions have put into place as a result of Senator Steinberg's SB 375 call for expanded transit. That is critical to meeting the goals of AB 32. We're thankful that Senator Steinberg's proposal acknowledges the role of transit systems in reducing, reducing greenhouse gas emission levels across California. Senator Steinberg's plan builds on an initial foundation laid by the governor who first proposed uh, investing in mass transit. We're excited that Senator Steinberg is confirming that public transit is not simply a discretionary service. It is essential and becoming increasingly more vital to the health and well-being of our state. We look forward to working with the senator, the governor, and the leaders in the assembly on finding a permanent source of funding for public transit. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Josh. And last but not least, Joel Keller, the board president of the Bay, Bay Area Rapid Transit, otherwise known as BART, who uh, we asked to speak because he can illustrate in a real life way what this kind of funding can mean to building on sustainable communities. Joel? Thank you. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for your leadership on this important issue. BART plays a major role in smart growth decisions by providing access to safe transit and development, which encourages a transit-first lifestyle affordable to all residents. After years of transit funding cuts from the state, a dedicated source of ongoing funds would be a game changer in helping make our roads less congested, our air cleaner, and access to transit easier. A perfect example of transit and affordable housing coming together to improve the quality of life for a community is the development of the planned MacArthur BART station in Oakland. The affordable housing element will accelerate the rise of an emerging uh, Oakland neighborhood, which was specifically targeted for green development because it is adjacent to one of BART's busiest uh, stations. The area surrounding the station will transform from an area of concrete and freeway to a beautiful space which serves a community of families from all walks of life. The, this type of revitalization gets at the heart of the purpose behind Senator Steinberg's landmark legislation, SB 375, and now there is a plan to provide those resources uh, to BART and others who can deliver on that promise. The Bay Area needs affordable housing close to transit throughout the entire BART system, and this cap-and-trade funding program could make that a reality. Thank you again, Senator Steinberg. Thank you very much, Mr. Keller. We'd be glad to answer questions, uh, myself or any member of the coalition. The governor's proposal to use some of this cap-and-trade money on high-speed rail is obviously controversial. Some environmentalists felt it wasn't the most efficient way to reduce emissions. Others felt that it was sort of a ploy to, to prop up Well, I've been a long time proponent of high speed rail. I think it's visionary. I think it is a major job creator. And I think that future generations will be glad that we withstood the controversy and, um, and followed through. But having said that, I do think that there is a danger that that controversy becomes the only thing that we talk about. Uh, and, and so, Part of the impetus behind this proposal is to show that we can put forward a comprehensive approach to climate change and to clean infrastructure. Uh, and together with cap and trade, a permanent source for public transit, I mean, that to me is the coin of the realm here. Uh, affordable housing, again, consistent with uh, our climate change goals, as well as the clean vehicles, as well as the energy efficiency, as well as, you know, the other investment opportunities here. I just think it, um, it, it, it's a winner. And uh, <clears throat> I understand that high-speed rail is controversial. If it, it were the only thing that we were talking about or the only thing on the table, you know, I, I, that, uh, I think that would be problematic. I think, uh, I think this is a better approach. Yes. It doesn't make sense to me, and you have a lot of questions about the cap and trade for high-speed rail proposal. Can you just walk it through? Sure. What I said at the time, if you remember, let's remember the history here. When it comes to high-speed rail, the Senate uh, delivered 21 votes with no minority uh, party support and with four members of the Senate, we had 25 at the time, being no from the get-go. So we, we uh, I guess you call it blackjack, uh, 21. 21 out of 21 out of 21. And it wasn't easy, but it was the right thing to do because of the need. My motivation is high wage job creation, as well as modernizing our transportation system. Uh, I said at the time, 
uh, last year or the beginning of this year, yes, I'm concerned about this in isolation. I, I don't understand how the governor's original cap and trade proposal would fund high speed rail. Now that we've sort of, we're attempting to put all these pieces together, it fits in very nicely. I think it fits in very nicely with a, with a comprehensive approach. And so I'm prepared to uh, continue my advocacy for high speed rail, but not in isolation. It goes with a, a, a more comprehensive approach to funding clean infrastructure and improving our climate. Senator, how did you reach your estimate that you're going to need $5 billion in capital revenue? That seems higher than what we've seen so far, and the other research report is not set up on that. I said up to. Um, the estimates are between uh, three and five, right? But um, we've done, when, when we did the carbon tax proposal, we did our, um, our projections, and we be believe that over time it can be as high as $5 billion. If it's less, well, one of the advantages of this approach, of course, is we lay out the funding by and large by percentages. And so if the number is $4 billion or $3.5 billion, then um, obviously the whole number for each of the pots will go down, but the percentages are, are still be robust, whether you're talking about three, four, or five, we're talking about a lot of money because it's not one time, it's annual. And why did you change your thought on the carbon tax? Why? Um, you know what? Uh, in the end, um, I'm not out to win a political argument. I'm out to get something significant done. And uh, carbon tax uh, wasn't very popular. And uh, I think it had its attributes. I also understood some of the concerns from the opposition that with a tax instead of cap and trade, someday the money could be used for things other than improving the climate. I heard that. And um, again, uh, I, I, I gave that speech to be a bit of a provocateur, uh, and, and it served that purpose. But in my remaining uh, seven months and 16 days in office, I, 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 I want to get things done, um, and that's why. Senator? Yes, sir. What does that leave the rest of California and more rural California? What opportunities do they have to tap this money? Because so much of it is based on I will let somebody answer the first part of your question. Maybe Annie or Tom or, or somebody who could, who could help me out. But on, on the second part, again, reading the weekend's press, this climate change problem is so vast that it is going to take all parts of the state, all sectors, all Californians doing their part. It can't just be an urban strategy. And 375, by the way, was not intended just as an urban strategy. It's intended to apply to all parts of the state. Um, and so we need everybody. But in terms of how we measure, let me turn it over to Tom or Andy. Or, or Michael, Mike McKeever from SACA. Go, go. I'm not going anywhere. How does this return that price to them? Because, because, well, first of all, some of the investment, significant part of the investment, will go to the diverse parts of the state, including the rural areas. Go ahead. Go ahead, then I'll. So I'm, I'm Mike McKeever. I'm the CEO of the Sacramento Area Council of Governments. A compatriot peer of mine, Steve Hemminger, has a similar job in the Bay Area with MTC. Okay. Under Senate Bill, 375, the senator's bill, the 18 regional planning agencies in the state have had to get very good at the analytics of estimating how people travel and what kind of air emissions that creates. And the, the short answer to the good question about urban and rural is that there are improvements to be made in all sectors of our society. And so a, a, an improvement in travel in a rural area might not at the end of the day get their vehicle miles traveled down as low as someone who lives in downtown Sacramento, but the increment of change might actually be greater than might happen in downtown uh, Sacramento. This is an issue that we 
deal with the, the 18 agencies all the time because our members are a collection of rural, suburban, and urban interests, and we have to deal with this dynamic all the time. There is plenty of improvement. In fact, you could argue greater improvement to be made in the suburban and rural areas even in the, than in the urban areas. But don't forget high-speed rail, which begins through the heart of rural California. I think high-speed rail will help improve the climate. But again, I, and I'm, I know that uh, that's where the controversy is, and of course I continue to maintain in this plan that that's a, a, an appropriate piece of the investment, but the message here, at least the message I intend, is that we are putting forward a comprehensive approach that includes high-speed rail as a part of the investment strategy, but it's the permanent sources for, for public transit, for housing, for, for clean energy that, um, that really uh, are the motivators behind this proposal. It, it, well, am I gonna continue to support high-speed rail? I support high-speed rail. I mean, I, uh, well, I support these funds. So long as that nexus can be made, uh, continue to be made, yes. Uh, yeah, you're talking a lot about permanent sources of funding. Yes. Well, one of the things I had in my original bill that some of the coalition members liked was uh, restating or updating, if you will, climate change, our climate change goals for 2050. And I would like to include that as part of my bill, continue to include that and continue to include that as part of the overall, uh, a, a, as part of the package. So we do need to, uh, to update um, our, our climate change goals well into 2050. Well, this is a statute. We're not proposing a constitutional amendment, so I suppose year to year the legislature uh, could. But part of the thing I worry about is that if we don't, if we don't articulate and pass a long-term funding plan, cap and trade every year will, will become a, well, who's in the front of the line? Where is the need seemingly the greatest? Uh, and I, I think that there is the potential of, of dribs and drabs, if you will, of this money annually without there being a, a, a coherent framework that we can all follow. And certainly there will be flexibility year to year. I want to emphasize as well, you know, some folks say, well, geez, why this much for transit and housing and not this much for clean cars? N none of this, this is not the Ten Commandments here. It is not written in stone. It is a proposal. And um, it's intended to put a very hard stake in the ground and begin a, a negotiation. But there will be discussion and negotiations about the relative percentages and numbers down the line. I expect that. That's the legislative process. But it, but it is good for California to put together a vision and a long-term funding strategy for what will amount to a large amount of money whether it's three, three and a half, four, or five billion. I have one question about that balancing. It says here that you have a competitive ranking process to ensure the right project. Correct. Uh, high thrill is not going to reduce greenhouse gases for years. Does that mean that it would get less funny in the short term, or would that it still guarantee that 20%? Well, again, the idea is 20%, but it's also, that's part of updating our climate goal and our climate targets to 2050, <laughs> because we want to measure not just what the climate impacts are going to be in 2020, but in the succeeding decades as well. So you're speaking of the ranking would be within... Within the pots, within the pots correct. Within the pots, not between the pots. Within the pots, correct. I have a question yeah, Mike. The yes. Seamus. So how does this help if you don't have any guarantee that the next legislature or the next governor might say, no, that's not a priority? 
Well, I think we know in California, not much is a guarantee. Um, so I, with the developments that go on in California, uh, affordable developers, they can, you know, they can look, they can buy a parcel of property, they can line up some of their other financing, and they'll be able to know far enough in advance. My guess is that they'll know at least a year in advance whether there's going to be money in that fund or not, that there will be enough of a process that they can, you know, within their sort of two to three year horizon, they'll be able to plan far enough out and make the decisions that they need to. And they're also generally pretty flexible in, you know, if there's not exactly the amount that they expected, to be able to find, you know, some other money to make make some of the deals pencil out. But with so little money right now in California around affordable development, this is really critical. And housing is a really critical tool, I think, for reaching our climate change goals. Can I add something here? Because everything is relative. And as I said, this is intended as a statute, not a constitutional amendment. But in terms of the permanent source discussions, which have been going on for a long time here uh, in the legislature and out in the communities of California, both transit and affordable housing are starting at zero. And so um, your question is a fair and a good one, but uh, if we state a permanent source in statute, uh, I, I think it'll be hard, especially as we begin seeing the results, uh, for that to be changed in any kind of a dramatic way. Well, again, first draft, um, it may be appropriate to securitize some of the other, uh, some of the other pots of money, but high-speed rail uh, is looking for a long-term capital source. And so when you take, you know, an annual increment, it can be securitized. That's the, that's the essence of what the governor has proposed. Our numbers are a little different, but, you know, we're going to enter into a discussion here as we move forward. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate y'all coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.